Structuralism, Part 1, The Blueprints and Building Blocks of Language. The Lego picture will make more sense in just a little bit. Moving on. What do these stories have in common? You've probably seen a slide like this before. If you've been in my class uh, when you were a sophomore, maybe. It makes you think of the Hero Quest at Moses and Leonard Bernstein and Harry Potter and I think Luke Skywalker up there. And what they all had in common, if you remember that slide, was that they all had sharp, pointy things symbolizing power, like a lightsaber or a wand or a staff or a conductor's baton. And we looked at the hero quest, and you probably remember that pretty well, the different elements of the hero quest. This is like that, but on steroids. So um, what do these have in common? We're not going to answer that question, but we're going to look at why we'd even ask that question to begin with. So structuralism really is uh, looking for commonalities, for common structures that underlie stories. And there's two roles. Uh, that structuralism plays. One is identifying structures and then gener generating categories from those structures. So if we look at the two diagrams here, you have a diagram of her sentence, her very good friend is courteous. And then below that is the, um, the diagram where it's filled in the parts of speech. And the reason that works is because of this, the grammatical structure. You could fill in any subject, any verb, any pred predicate, adjective, etc., in those places and it would make sense. Let's see if that's true. So the two approaches to structuralism. Number one, you have these six different stories, right? Uh, Harry Potter and Tangled and Luke Skywalker and Spider-Man and Lord of the Rings and Superman. And you look at them all and you try to identify a common underlying structure. That was sort of what we did with the Hero Quest a few years ago. We look at all the stories, and oh, there's a call to adventure in each one, and there's a mentor, and uh, you know, a death and a resurrection, etc., etc. The other thing you can do with structuralism is to look at a single story and see if it conforms to this underlying structure that you've already identified with other stories. Does Jane Eyre fit that? Let's look at that again. Here's what you know. Let's see, your Harry Potter, orphan, tangled, raised by someone else, orphan, those Skywalker, raised by somebody else, orphan, let's see, uh, Spider-Man, yeah, Lord of the Rings, if you've read the book, you find out that Frodo's parents were killed in, when he was a young boy, Spider-Man, orphan, raised by the Kents, yeah, look, I mean, just on that by itself, yes, it follows. The hero quest is one of these underlying structures you could look at, but there are even more basic uh, grammatical story structures. If, you, if a story has a grammar, there are even more basic ones than that. So those are the two approaches. One, look at stories and find the similarities, find the underlying structure that's common to all of them, or look at a single story and see if it lines up with the previously identified underlying structure. So structures have rules. <coughs> For example, wholeness. The sum is different than the parts. Uh, this is true of a water molecule, right? Hydrogen atoms are one thing, and oxygen atom is something else. You put them together in the right configuration, and what you have is different than either of them. It's something new. Uh, I'm going to even go so far as to say greater than the sum of its parts. I think that's kind of cool. So... Rule number one of the structure, wholeness. Okay, number two, transformation. You can add new parts to a structure. A structure is not fixed. It is not static. It is not built once and forever locked into place. So, for example, um, this is from the Oxford English Dictionary. It is the verb Google, which, believe it or not, a verb that did not exist when I was your age. In fact, if you look at the top one here, you see 1999 is the first recorded use of the verb Google. Has anyone Googled? Try Google.com. It's very, very clean and fast. This is someone on some sort of news group telling its friends, hey, there's this new thing out there called Google. Can you imagine that? 
because, see, I was already out of high school six years before that happened. Or the transitive version. Um, I've Googled some keywords, and it came up with some other EDU text. You can add new verbs to a structure. This verb did not exist when I was your age. But because transformation is the second rule of structures, it means you can add new things. But there's a hitch, and that's rule number three. The new parts will obey existing rules. So, for example, with the verb here, uh, the new verb, Google, there's an intransitive version, and there's a transitive version. And guess what? The transitive version takes an object. Look at that first entry in 2000. I've Googled some keywords, keywords being the direct object. Or look at the intransitive version from 2004. The couple found themselves Googling for a new place to live. Intransitive. And intransitive doesn't take an object. So even though you can add new things to the structure, they have to follow the rules that already exist for the structure. You can't just say, whoa, man, that's a really googly shirt you're wearing. That doesn't work. It doesn't work that way. Maybe someday it will. But right now, the word Google is not an adjective. It's a verb. Um, I found a Google on the sidewalk. It's not a noun. It's a verb, and it functions as a verb. Okay, Google the company is a noun, but that's a different issue. You don't find a Google. Does that make sense? Wholeness, greater than the sum of its parts. Transformation, you can add new things. Um, Self-regulation, has to obey the rules when it's added. Three rules of a structure. Here's a little comic. Case in point, I think. So, language has structure. You're probably saying at this point in time, wait a second, I thought we were talking about stories. We're going to get there. That's mostly next week with narratology. But the idea here is that language has a basic structure and stories follow suit. And, well, just see where we're going with this. Hang in with it with me. So, there's two elements to the structure of a language. There are the surface phenomena, um, the words and the sounds that we make. I could say, um, tree. Okay, there is a word or a sound that I made. But then there's the structure, the grammar that helps us make sense of that. For example, is tree a verb, a noun, something else? Because I could say, I see a tree, and it's a noun. Or, um, my dog tried to tree a raccoon last night. Now it's a verb. And we know what it means, partly because of the surface phenomenon, the actual word, but also partly because of the structure in which it's placed, the words that come before and after it, and how they function. And we can't make sense of that word without all of that. For example, I told you once that all English sentences boil down to a subject and a predicate. Now, it gets slightly more fancy. You might have a subject and a transitive verb and an object. You might have a subject and an intransitive verb. But guess what? You're not going to have any sentence in English that isn't one of these two. All sentences boil down to subject predicate. All sentences. If they don't, they're not sentences. And they don't make complete sense. So we have specialized words for this, of course, because we like to hear ourselves talk, us literary theorists. These surface phenomena, or words or sounds, are called parole. And the structure that lies underneath it is uh, lang. I'm putting a another video uh, link uh, up on... Um, Moodle tonight. It's a link to a YouTube video that explains this more fully in greater detail. I encourage you to watch it. But um, for now, the surface phenomenon, the individual words and sounds like tree, is parole. But the underlying structure, subject, transitive verb, object, I see a tree. That's the lang. You gotta have both. 
Lang is not superior to parole, because without the parole, you have no Lang. But you can't make sense of the parole without the Lang. Does that make sense? I'm pretty sure it does. I'm just adding new words to things you probably already know. By the way, the reason we do that in French is because structuralism was born in France, and so we use their language. Okay, moving on a little bit. Sign equals the signifier plus the signified. That is a rather cryptic statement. So let's figure out what it means. <coughs> Excuse me. There are um, a couple different kinds of signs. What does a sign mean? Like if you see a stop sign on the street, um, it has those letters S-T-O-P and it's kind of you know, hexagonal in shape and it's red with the white letters. Um, is that the kind of sign we're talking about? Um, well, yes, in part. We're also talking about individual words. We're also talking about pictures. Here's what I mean. A signifier is the thing that is showing and the signified is what is meant by that. So if I say the word tree, to use my example, uh, the signifier is that particular sound, tree, or those four letters, T-R-E-E, -E, or the, what you see written on the page, T-R-E-E, -E, right, what you hear coming out of my mouth. That's the signifier. The signified is the idea of tree. Right? You might picture a maple or a pine tree or something in your head, this abstraction of tree, or maybe you have a specific tree in mind. That's the signified. That's what's meant. The signifier is, what am I using to get that idea across to you? So, if we were face-to-face -face right now, what I would do to show you the index is I would light a match. And I might hold it close to you. Okay, and you can smell it, right? And you see the smoke coming up. and You put your hand over it, and you're going to feel the heat. It's going to burn you. Now, let's say the concept we're getting at is fire. Okay, so the signified is fire. The signifier is this actual fire or the smoke. Okay, so you can't see the fire, but you can feel the heat. You can smell the smoke and you can, um, you know, it burns you a little bit. That's an index. There is a concrete causal relationship between those two things. You don't have smoke if there's not a fire. And so if you see smoke coming up, you can say, hey, there's a fire. And that's true in any culture, anywhere, at any time, in the entire world. There's not a place on earth where smoke does not naturally result from fire. The signifier is causally linked to the signified. Smoke, what does that mean? Fire, true around the world in every case. Now, it may not be a big fire. It may not be a fire you can see very well. Don't have smoke without fire. That's an index. But not every sign works that way. For example, the icon, in which the signifier physically resembles a signified. So there's a picture of a fire on your screen there. It's not an actual fire. Now, you could probably show that picture anywhere in the world and people are going to go, yeah, know what it means. And if you, know, you want a fire, you show that picture, you'll probably get your point across. Because an icon physically resembles the thing that it stands for. Whereas the index results from it. Okay, so the smoke is a natural result from it. The icon looks like it. Now, I don't have these pictures, but you could maybe do a crude drawing of a campfire. That would still be an icon. At some point in time, your drawing is going to become so abstract, though, that it no longer resembles the fire. Okay, and that's where we get to the next step. So let's review first. Index. The signifier is causally linked to the signified. Okay, it comes from it naturally. With the icon, it looks like it. Okay, and think about icons and in uh, Catholic or in Orthodox churches. Um, they don't claim to be Christ or the Virgin Mary. They just look like them. They represent them. 
but they are not them, and nobody mistakes them for the actual thing. Okay, but we know what we're talking about. We see that picture, we go, oh, Jesus, okay. A symbol, then, is the relationship between the signifier and the signifier. It is arbitrary. So take those four letters, F-I-R-E, or take the sound, fire, the fire. What does that have to do with an actual fire? Except that all of us that speak English agree that Okay, when we say that those sounds, fire, we will be referring to this thing that's really hot and it burns and it makes smoke. See, that only means that because we all agree it does. And if you don't speak English, you have no idea what that means. So if I'm in, oh, I don't know, let's say uh, Siberia and I'm freezing and I stumble across a group of natives that speak no English, have never been exposed to English, and I say, fire, 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 because I'm cold, they will have no idea what I'm talking about. And saying it louder won't make it work because that's something that English speakers agree to. It's an arbitrary relationship between those four letters and those sounds and an actual fire. Whereas with an icon, ah, picture, it's more closely related. And then the index, it's causally related to the two. So think about Lord of the Flies and the conch representing leadership. That is a symbol. There's nothing natural about a conch and leadership that are linked. We have just agreed, or William Golding intended, or I don't know. We just kind of agree as a reading community that that's what it represents. And I think it does. But it's a symbol. Does this make sense? Review one more time. Index causal relationship between signifier and signified. Icon, physical resemblance between signifier and signified. Symbol, arbitrary relationship. It only means that because we all agree it does. We could stop agreeing that tomorrow and it would stop meaning it. Let's move on. Now, we talked about these underlying structures in language, that all languages, or at least in English, all sentences of subject and predicate. And we've seen it in stories in the past with the hero quest, right? Um, all these stories have these elements in common. And we'll be covering that again next week. Well, here's where structurists love to go. Human cultures have these underlying structures as well. So there's six pictures in front of you, and these are all pictures from wedding ceremonies around the world. Uh, I'm starting in the upper left-hand corner with the hands. I believe that's from India. To the right, the um, couple, that's, I believe, Korean. Go to the right again. That is, I, I don't want to say what country it is because I'll get it wrong. Uh, it's in Africa, but I do not remember the country. The same is true of the picture below that. You go to the left, and there's a um, Native American couple. And you go to the left again, and I believe they are from Nepal. So here's the question. These are all wedding pictures. What do they have in common if they're underlying structures? Just look at that for a sec. I'm going to guess that you noticed, one, um, there's specialized headgear. Um, you can't see the picture with the hands, but there's specialized headgear, right? Um, the girl on the lower right has got the... Um, kind of cool cross-looking thing in her forehead. Above, they have hats. The Korean couple have special hats. The Native American couple have special hats. That's kind of cool. You might notice that the guy is wearing something special, too. Um, okay. Uh, you can't see this in all the pictures, but you may notice that the woman has something in her hands. Okay, the, the two hands certainly do. The Korean woman has got that big kind of shawly thing. The um, Native American woman has the feathers. And what cultural anthropologists have noticed, who are structuralists, is that wedding ceremonies around the world all involve these things. Their special headdress. All wedding ceremonies have this. Their special clothes you only wear that one time. 
usually the woman has something special in her hands. Now, this is very interesting, right? Looking at all these non, you know, non-Western, except for possibly the Native Americans, all these non-Western um, ideas. It's very interesting until you look at this slide. Because, oh, look at that. It's true of us, too. There's the bride with her specialized headdress and something in her hands. Let's, let's look at that again. Okay, here's the... Here's all these foreign cultures. I'll say foreign for most of us. Not foreign for everybody, but for most of us. And here's a nice American wedding. And structurally, it's exactly the same thing. The lang is exactly the same, although the parole is different. Obviously, our brides were white, guys in a tux. You go back to these pictures, there's a wide variety of styles. But those are just the surface phenomenon. Those are just the individual words. The underlying structure is exactly the same. Same is true of other rites of passage. Okay, and some of these look so foreign to Western eyes. Uh, there's a upper left-hand corner, a bar mitzvah. A young Jewish boy studying for his uh, bar mitzvah when he turns 13. Um, he had their specialized clothing. The girl on the right, it's, it's uh, she's 15. She's from Hispanic culture. It's a quinceanera, I believe. It's a huge rite of passage. Oh, look, specialized headgear. Um, go to the right. I, again, I don't know the tribe. I don't want to say, but the plate in the lip. Um, now, before you look at that and go, oh, no, body mutilation, we would never do that. How many people get tattoos? How many people get their ears pierced? as a rite of passage. Is it to that size? No. Is it the same underlying structure? Yes. Okay, go down below that. There's the corsages that you will only wear once, maybe twice in your life. Right? In fact, it's so specific, you can look at that picture and know that you're talking about prom. Because that's the only time you ever wear that. Ever. Okay? The girl to the left has got a scar tissue on her head because in her culture, the rite of passage involves some self-mutilation. Again, just like tattoos or getting your ears pierced. And then there's a leg tattoo, and he's a Pacific Islander. Um, it's really interesting. The parole is different, but the lang is the same. Oh, look at that. You have a rite of passage coming up in which you wear clothes you will only wear once in your life, and you engage in ritualized behavior like the throwing the hats up in the air that you will only do once in your life. But you do it. Underlying structure is exactly the same. All right, let's sum up. All language, all language, whether it's verbal or written or nonverbal you know, gestures, what have you, is built upon underlying structures. Not the skeleton picture because it's a skeleton holding the whole thing together. And these structures are human constructs. They're not natural in the sense that we just copy them from math or what have you. Uh, we make them up. And they mean what they mean because we all agree that they mean what they mean. If everybody in the world decide that you don't need to have a verb, I don't know how that would work, can't even imagine it, um, verbs would cease to have meaning. Okay, strange. That's not a very good example. I'm going off the top of my head here. Here's the, the thing. I had a student last year who told me he was sick and tired of conforming to society and he didn't like social constructs and he decided that he was just going to reject all social constructs and do his own thing. Then I told him the very fact that he was able to articulate that idea to me was because he bought into a social construct, the construct of language. He thought about it for a while and he said, okay. And I said, furthermore, aren't you a, mus a musician? He said, yeah. I said, so when you look at a piece of music and it's treble clef and there's a dot on that second line up and you play a G aren't you just agreeing to a social construct? It only means G because we all agree it means G. It doesn't it's it's a symbol. It doesn't naturally mean G. It's not causally related to G. 
you can't even communicate that you hate social constructs without using a social construct. That was what I was trying to get across to him. He didn't like that. Coulters work the same way. All right, and so the bride you see in this picture is exactly like a bride from any other culture. She's got the headdress and the fancy clothes that she only wears once and the thing in her hand. Underlying structure is exactly the same way, and we don't even realize that we've all are playing into this structure. We don't even know these exist. We just take them for granted. We assume they're natural. But they're constructs. That's it. That is part one of structuralism. And if you got just this uh, and you missed class and this is what you're looking at instead, um, not bad. I suggest that you still get notes from somebody else. Awesome. Bye.